Listen to it fizz. Alka-Seltzer for headaches. Alka-Seltzer for acid indigestion. Alka-Seltzer for cold discomfort. Alka-Seltzer presents the Quiz Kids. Class is called to order Quiz Kids, and listen closely. Here's your first question. At what one place might you see a mouse trap, a button hook, and a Statue of Liberty in action? Adjust your thinking caps, friends, and see if you can answer that one along with the youngsters here in our classroom. And here they are, the Quiz Kids and the Chief Quizzer himself, Joe Kelly. Thank you, Bob Murphy, and hello, everyone. Say, Bob, that was a good suggestion of yours. And for the next half hour, I hope all you folks will pretend you're back in school and see just how many of today's questions you can answer. You know, we'll all be doing a lot of thinking about education and its importance in the American way of life this week. Yes, this week of November 7th marks the 28th Annual Observation of American Education Week. Our Quiz Kids classroom is honored to have Miss Mabel Studebaker, this year's president of the National Education Association, here to open the observance. Later on in our program, we're going to turn this microphone over to Miss Studebaker. But right now, Quiz Kids, let's get busy on our schoolwork. Here we go with roll call. Joel? I'm Joel Kupperman. I'm 12 years old in 8th grade in the Volta School. Patrick? I am Patrick Owen Conlon. I'm 11 years old and in 7th grade at the Fort Dearborn School in Chicago. Lonnie. I'm Lonnie Lundy. I'm 12 years old and in the 8th grade at Lincoln School in Park Ridge, Illinois. And returning to class, we have David. I'm David Freifelder. I'm 13 years old and a freshman in Waukegan Township High School, Waukegan, Illinois. And a very pretty, petite little newcomer, Miriam. I am Miriam Amber. I go to Bateman Newton School in morning kindergarten. Well, how old are you, honey? That's a girl, that's right. Five years of old age. How do you like that? And now let's get back to your first question from Mrs. Raymond Alsop of Salinas, California. At what one place might you see a mouse trap, a button hook, and a Statue of Liberty in action? We have two hands up, and Joel's hand was first. Well, you would see that on our football field because... Uh, they're all different kinds of plays. The mouse traps where you lure an opposing lineman in. A uh, Statue of Liberty is where a back gets the ball, holds it high up in his hand, and uh, another back uh, uh, snatches it from his hand. Hooray! That's right, Joel. Fine. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, they're all football terms. And it's absolutely right now for sending in that question. Alka Seltzer sends Mrs. Raymond Alsop of Salinas, California, a fine Zenith Transoceanic Shortwave Portable Radio, the most outstanding portable on the market today. Now, that's always Alka Seltzer's reward, friends, when the quiz kids answer your question correctly. If they miss, Alka Seltzer sends you a big Zenith radio phonograph combination with the new Cobra Tone Arm, two FM bands, the whole works. And this set is a real beauty. So try your hand at stumping these youngsters. Send your questions to Quiz Kids Chicago. All right, here we go with more questions. Mrs. L.R. Proctor of Phoenix, Arizona, always feels sorry for the underdog in football. She thinks it would help out a lot if the losing football teams had some brand new yells. So I'm going to hand out paper and pencils, and you quiz kids get to work while you're answering questions and see if you can write a new yell for whatever team you think might need it. For instance, uh, you might start out with uh, rickety, raggedy, Russ, so-and-so will win for us. See, that's the idea. Or uh, you can start from scratch and make up your own beginning and say, you folks at home might like to try this along with the quiz kids. It's a lot of fun. Uh, oh, and by the way, Miriam, I know you're, you're very little to be trying this. You're only five years old. Uh, would you like someone to help you on uh, this, honey? You would? All right, fine. Bob Murphy, will you come up here? Come on, son. Get right up here. The announcer's mic now. I'd like to ask you to help out little five-year-old Miriam and write a college yell during the program, and I'll call for the yells later on. Will you do that? Joe. Huh? Are you serious? I certainly <laughs> am. <laughs> Miriam, 
You got no help at all. <laughs> all right, well, do what you can, Bob, will you? After all, she's only five years old, and I'm sure that you can think up something to help her along there. All right, now then. <laughs> Between commercials, <clears throat> uh, try this one, kids. From L.V. Boer of Indianapolis, Indiana, can you give the name of the dog that each of these storybook people would whistle to? Uh, first one would be uh, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Patrick. That'll be Toto. Toto, that's right. And how about the next one, Rip in Rip Van Winkle? Uh, Miriam. What's the dog's name? What's Wolf. The... Wolf is right, absolutely. <laughs> that's fine, Miriam. I don't know whether we should ask uh, Bob to help you or not. <laughs> All right, this question here is a very timely one, kids. We are surrounded by many changes of nature at this time of year. And Frank C. Callahan of Oak Park, Illinois, wonders if you can answer these questions. Does frost bring about the beautiful colors of leaves in the fall? David? Well, uh, no, because in, in every leaf there are three basic compounds. There's chlorophyll, the green matter, and xanthophyll, the yellow matter, and carotene, the red matter. And yeah. It's not frost that does it, but when it, uh, the uh, chlorophyll begins to, or the chloroplasts, which are chlorophyll bo bodies, yeah. begin to die out, and the xanthophyll begins to grow, and it covers up uh, what's left of the chlorophyll, and the leaf is then yellow. And then the xanthophyll bodies stop growing, and the carotene bodies begin to grow, and they cover up the yellow. And uh, then you have the red color. And then when the carotene dies, you have the true color of the leaf, which is brown. And it's, it's dry, and then the leaf would probably fall off. Well, David, that's a very, very good answer. Yes, sir. That doesn't leave me anything to say, and I wanted to say something there. <laughs> All right. Well, why do leaves fall off? All right, David. Well, that's because... Uh, the structure of leaves is so that it has uh, pores all over yeah. on the on the upper and lower side of the leaf, and uh, water is given off in great quantities when it when it's uh, warm. Then, when it begins to get cool, the uh, the roots can't absorb as much water as they do, and the leaves would still give off as much water, and there 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 wouldn't be enough water in the leaf in the in the whole tree, and the tree would dry up and die. That's right. Absolutely <laughs> right. Well, we certainly tied a nice little blue ribbon around that one. Uh, now then, you'll have to tighten your thinking caps for this question from Phyllis Colber of Chicago, Illinois. Howard Peterson will play part of a popular song. The title should suggest the name of an inventor. And you quiz kids are to name a song whose title mentions the invention. All right, Howard, number one. <laughs> Lonnie. That's bell-bottom trousers, so the inventor will be uh, Bell, I guess, and he invented the... He's most famous for inventing the telephone. Oh, all right. So it'll be something with the phone in it or something. It could be... Uh, well, I didn't sleep a wink last night. The uh, Part of it goes, I had to call you up this morning to see if everything was still all right. That's very, very good. Uh, very good, Lonnie. What were you going to say, Pat? Well, there could also be Hello Central. Hello Central, yes. Uh huh. That's a very good one. And uh, David? Well, telephones ring, and it could be I've got spurs that jingle, jangle, jingle. <laughs> yeah, that's all right, too. Yeah. Well, let's see what we can do with the next one. Lonnie? Well, that's why don't you do right, and that'd yes. be the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers. So that and could be, if they invented the airplane, so that could be Calm Josephine in my flying machine. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful, Lonnie. <laughs> well, while I'm selecting this next run uh, from Alka Seltzer's question box, uh, here's Bob Murphy. And I want to talk to all you folks who have never tried Alka Seltzer for the relief of headaches. The next time you have a headache or someone in your family has a headache, just drop one or two Alka-Seltzer tablets into a glass of water. Watch it bubble up and dissolve. Then drink it. You'll be amazed and delighted at how quickly this glass of sparkling Alka-Seltzer brings relief from the pain and distress of your headache. 
It's not like taking pills at all. It's so pleasant to take, so gentle and soothing, yet so fast in relieving the pain that you'll be delighted because your headache will be relieved almost before you know it. Now, if you are one of the few people who have never taken Alka-Seltzer for headache pain, the next time you have a headache, all we ask you to do is try it. Alka-Seltzer will do the rest. Remember, if Alka-Seltzer does not please you, your money will be refunded. So ask your druggist for Alka-Seltzer and try it for the relief of headaches or for acid indigestion or the distress of colds. We know that if you will try it, you will never be without it in your home because there's nothing quite like Alka-Seltzer. All right, thank you, Bob. Now you can get back to your little... Uh cheerleader contribution here in helping Miriam. <laughs> well, kids, uh, this whimsical question is from Mrs. Danny Boyle of Hammond, Indiana. Judging by the contestants' uh, first names, why might you say the boxing match for the middleweight championship last September could have been called the Battle of the Waves? There's something to think about. Lonnie. Well, the first names of the uh, fighters were... Marcel for Marcel Sardin and Tony. And, and Tony for, who? Well, Tony Zale. Tony, well, Tony Zale. is a permanent wave. Yes. And uh, Marcel wave, I don't know. Uh, that would you be. don't, uh, but Patrick? I think uh, Marcel has something to do with uh, something like that, too, a Marcel wave. It would be, uh... Is that what, uh, uh, Lonnie? Maybe Marcel. Seems uh, Marcel's a French name. Maybe he was some noted be beautifier or something. Well, no. Let's see. Uh, Miriam, could uh, do you know what Marcel? I mean, your mother. Or uh, well, I'm. I can't tell you what uh, Marcel. Does that mean anything to you, honey? No, never heard of it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you worry, honey. You will one of these days. Uh, David. Well, Marseille, or uh, should be Marseille, is a city in France, and it's on the ocean, and there are well, waves. Well, now remember, in the ocean. we ask you uh, why couldn't it have been called the Battle of the Waves, uh, Pat? Well, it might be uh, Marseille is a French name, and uh, Marseille might be a French uh, woman, a French wave, a French woman sailor. Wait. Oh, well, wait a minute. We're, we're getting uh, off the beam on this, uh, Joel. Well, I was going to say that uh, Marcel might be the first name of uh, American Wave. Well, it certainly is. Yes, that's right. Uh huh. Marcel is, and uh, Lonnie said, uh, Tony, permanent, uh, ask the man who has had one. <laughs> All right, fine. Now, uh, here we go with the next question. Mrs. Margaret Woodruff of Mill Valley, uh, California, is a Shakespeare fan and wants to try you on this question. She wants me to read uh, you one of her favorite lines, and if possible, you are to give me the following line. Here's the, the line I'm going to read. The quality of mercy is not strained, Patrick. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses he that give and he that takes. It is noblest in the noblest and... <laughs> So on, and that's from uh, The Merchant of Venice and who by says? Shakespeare. And Portia says that when Portia. she is arguing for uh, Antonio's life in the courtroom. Right as no rain, dialogue. Patrick. Right as rain, huh? <laughs> well, here's, here's another favorite. Uh, see if you can give the next line. Uh, <clears throat> but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? Miriam. It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, uh, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her mate, art far more fair than she. Well, that's wonderful, isn't it? How do you like that? Bless her heart. And uh, that's from Romeo and Juliet, isn't it, Miriam? Yeah. You bet you, my well, life, eh? Hey. lessons, I ought to know it. Well, I, yeah, well, I should say so. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, H.S. Jones of New York City recalls how differently election returns are received today from times in the past. Last Tuesday, the presidential candidates were gathered around radios and television sets and heard the latest count every few minutes. Now, we are going to carry you back a few years and portray how other men received the news that they had become president. You children are to identify the president 
who is speaking. I am overcome at this news you bring of the sudden death of the president. I appreciate the speed by which you have brought me these sad tidings, traveling tirelessly as you have by boat and buggy. Needless to say, I am caught unawares at the idea of my becoming president. I haven't made any plans, and what's more, I haven't a cent to take me to the capital, unless a few of my friends can advance some funds. You see, I've not yet received my first check for serving as vice president. Well, now, let's see. We, uh, we had a tie. We had three hands up at the, practically the same time. So, uh, let's, we'll start with Lonnie. That was, uh, John Tyler. And he Joel, you were going to say? Yeah, I was going to say John Tyler, John Tyler. because he was, uh, penniless at the time. Uh -huh. And they used a buggy then, and they'd need a boat to bring it to him because he <coughs> was in Virginia. And, uh, David, I remember, uh, we're all on our honor on this. David? No, I wasn't. I wasn't thinking of that. <coughs> oh, you, and Patrick? Well, uh, that, uh, that's right. Uh, Joel and Lonnie are right. I was thinking of that, too. He was taking the, the place of uh, William Henry Harrison. All right, well, I just... president who died uh, one month in office. He was only in office one uh, month. Fine. Well, I want to uh, be fair and square in this. Uh, that's the reason I called uh, the fact uh, to our listeners that it was a tie. Now, in this next instance, uh, identify the president who is receiving the news. Say... You may be losing Sangamon County, but here's another telegram that says you're carrying Pennsylvania and you're safe in New York. That's enough. The Republicans are in. Well, sir, it don't seem like the town telegraph office is just the most exciting place to find out you're elected president, but anyway, all of us want to congratulate you. And what do you say, boys? Let's give a cheer for our new president. Bonnie? Well, I'm not sure. Could that be Abe Lincoln? Are you He's... sure? No, I'm not sure. Well, let's see if we can clarify. Joel? I'm very sure because uh, the Sangamon County was his home county. That's absolutely right. Abraham Lincoln is the answer. Uh-huh. All right. Now then, uh, kids, if Mr. Dewey ran for president again, it would be his third attempt. Has anyone ever made three attempts after failing the first two times? Uh, Joel? Uh, William Jennings Bryan. Yes, he ran uh, three times. I think it was in uh, 1896. A 1900 and 1908. That's correct, uh-huh. And Patrick? Well, uh, af not after the first two times, but Grover Cleveland ran once in 1884 and won, and he lost in 1888, and he won again in 1892. Well, that's... And also Norman Thomas has run more than three times. <laughs> yes, that's true. And uh, <laughs> so has Eugene V. Debs of the both socialists. They both uh, that's right, uh-huh. All three of them are correct, uh-huh. And now, uh... I see Bob Murphy is ready with a question. Yes, Joe, and, and let's turn the tables here. Instead of asking, suppose you answer. Here's the question. In how many homes is old man cold making his rounds on this first Sunday of November? Oh, now, say, Bob, that's not <laughs> fair. How could I possibly answer a question like that? Well, all right, Joe, try this one then. How many folks are prepared to do something about it when cold misery comes along? Thousands and thousands. In fact, all the folks who know about Alka-Seltzer and the ABC Cold Comfort Treatment. Right. 100% perfect, Joe. Step to the head of the class, Mr. Kelly. And friends, if you or someone in your family has a cold right now, remember that Alka-Seltzer can help you to fast relief from much of your cold distress. Alka-Seltzer's ABC Cold Comfort Treatment is easy to follow, and you'll certainly welcome the way it can ease your discomfort. Listen, here it is. A, Alka-Seltzer. Start taking it at once to help relieve that ache in every bone, feverish feeling of your cold. B, be wise. Beware of drafts. Be sure you dress sensibly and try to get more rest than usual. Be careful of your diet. And C, comfort the sore throat caused by your cold by gargling with Alka-Seltzer. There it is, simple and easy. And let me remind you that you cannot know how good Alka-Seltzer can be until you try it. So do try it right now if you're suffering from a cold. Yes, go to your drugstore for Alka-Seltzer. And instead of one, buy two. That's the wisest thing to do. All right, here we go with more questions. Now, one of the leading national public opinion polls predicted that 44.5% of the popular vote would go to Mr. Truman. At the time, Mrs. Estelle Winters of Seattle, Washington, sent in this question... The total popular vote was 
300000 and Mr. Truman had 49.8% of it. In terms of people, how many more people had voted for Mr. Truman at that time than was predicted? Joel? Could you repeat that question again, please? All right. One of the leading national public opinion polls predicted uh, that 44.5% of the popular vote would go to Mr. Truman. Now, when this question was sent in, the total popular vote was 43 million. Uh, did you want to continue from there on, Joel? No, no, I just was keeping my... my oh, I see. All right. The total popular vote was 43,300,000, and Mr. Truman had 49.8% of it. In terms of people, how many more people had voted for Mr. Truman at that time than was predicted, Joe? Well, it would be 5.3% of 43,300,000. Right. So that would be, uh, let's see, 5.3 uh, over uh, 5.3 times 43,300,000 um, over 100. So it would be 5.3 times uh, 43,300,000 over 10. That would be 433. And 433 and three zeros, or uh, 433 and three zeros, or 433 and two zeros times 53. Uh, so 433 times 53, let's see, 433 times 53, 50 times 433 is uh, 2165, 2165 plus 1299. Uh, 2165 plus 1299 is uh, 3464. So it'll be, uh, let's see, 3464 would be 360, uh, 3464. It'll be 3,464,000. Oh, 360, 3464 would be 346,400. No. Sorry, David? Uh, 3,500,000. No. No. Too many. Lonnie? Now, what was the, uh, original, the number again of popular vote when she sent in the question? Uh, the popular vote was 43,300,000. 43,300,000, huh? and uh, the uh, poll showed 44.5% of the popular vote, and the final returns was 49.8. Uh, yes. Well, that's 5.3 times 48. Well, we had that before. Yeah. Now we started out all right. Well, okay. 40, then it's 48. Did you say 48,300,000? Uh, no, I said 43 million. 43 million. 43,300,000? Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, then, the, in other words, it's 5.3 times 43,000, or 43,300,000, or that automatically puts five zeros at the end of it. So that's, a, let's see, 40, uh, 3 times 3 is 9. That's 900,000. Let's see. And... Uh, then nine again. That's 129. Uh, 129 million. Uh. No, I look, uh, Lonnie. Uh, I know you're trying, and I admire you an awful lot for it. Uh, we have two other hands up here, and time is really going by. Uh, so let's see if we can get the correct answer uh, real quick now. Uh, uh, Joel. It'll be 53 times 433 with. Uh, it would be 53 times 433 with two zeros. So that would be 50 times 433. Uh, 50, wait, 53 times 433 with two zeros. 50 times four, th 3 times 433 is 1299. And uh, 1299. And 50 times 433 is uh, 21650. 21, plus 21,650 plus 1299 would be uh, 22,000, 22,940, 20, uh, 22,949 with two zeros. So that would be 2 million, 294,900 votes. That's absolutely right. Oh, That's wonderful. Yeah, we certainly really got 
<laughs> we tried on that one, didn't we? And finally got it. And, uh, and now, friends, before we give our attention to this next question, I want you to meet our guest observer. She is teacher of biology at the Strong Vincent High School, Erie, Pennsylvania, and has for many years been an outstanding leader in the field of education, having held many important positions. This year, she is serving as president of the National Education Association. Yes, it's a pleasure to welcome Miss Mabel Studebaker to the Quiz Kids classroom. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I'm sure we all realize that today's children are living in a fast-moving age. Their knowledge of technology and world affairs would stump many adults, as these Quiz Kids programs demonstrate over and over. They will be America tomorrow. They will fly the skies, find new cures for disease, make the laws, advance science and the arts, raise the crops, produce the world's goods, promote the general welfare, and participate in world affairs. Will they succeed in finding the answers to the problems they will face as well as these quiz kids answer the questions put to them today? We hope so. How well they succeed depends largely upon the kind of education they are now receiving. To assure their tomorrow, we should give them the best possible advantages today and see that good schools are brought within the reach of all our girls and boys. To prepare today's children for the work of their time is to help build the future security and greatness of our nation to strengthen the foundations of freedom. And that's the theme for American Education Week, which begins today, strengthening the foundations of freedom. American Education Week is being observed all over the land, November 7 to 13. You are invited to visit your school and see teachers and pupils in action. As schools imbue the minds and hearts of youth with the principles of our free government and teach the ways of democracy, they are helping to keep America strong and free. America's future depends upon America's schools. Let's make our schools strong. And now, Mr. Kelly, let me thank you for the opportunity to make this announcement of American Education Week. This program's continued emphasis upon education and recognition of superior teaching, especially through your Best Teacher Contest, are greatly appreciated. Well, Miss Studebaker, it's been a privilege to have you here today. I know that the Miles Laboratories, our sponsor, greatly appreciate your recognition of the efforts made by the Quiz Kids program in the field of education. And I am happy to announce at this particular time the opening of the fourth annual Quiz Kids Best Teacher Contest next Sunday, November 14th. This contest is a natural follow-up to American Education Week because they have the same great objectives, that of emphasizing the vital importance of good teachers and education to our American way of life. I will have more to say about the fourth annual Quiz Kids Best Teacher Contest later on. In the, the uh, meantime, I, I have your report cards now, children. Seems like our little mathematical problem uh, got us way behind in time. We, haven't, we won't be able to call for your... Um, yells that I assign to you. But uh, now remember, whether you win or lose, you will each receive a $100 savings bond from the makers of Alka-Seltzer to help you with your future education. And I also want to remind you that your age is taken into consideration, as well as the number of correct answers you gave when the judges add up the scores. And here's their report. They say that as a class, well, you didn't miss any questions this afternoon. Joel first, Lonnie second, and David third. So we'll see you three back at your desks next Sunday, and you'll be competing with Nancy McCleary, age 12, and Richard Weichler, age 8. Well, we're getting an early start in our search for the best teacher of 1949 this year, friends. As I told you, our fourth annual Quiz Kids Best Teacher Contest begins next Sunday, November 14th, with bigger prizes for everyone this year. Dr. Paul A. Whitty, professor of education at Northwestern University and chairman of our scholarship committee, will be here to tell us about the rules and regulations. And I know students all over the country will want to hear this important announcement. So all you folks listening, be sure to tell the boys and girls you know about this great opportunity coming up next week, won't you? Remember, that's next Sunday, November 14th, for the opening of the fourth annual Quiz Kids Best Teacher Contest. And now until next Sunday, this is Joe Kelly dismissing the Quiz Kids. Goodbye, kids. Bye, Bye Mr. Kelly. Kelly. Listen to the Quiz Kids every week and listen to Alpha Tell the News of the World every Monday through Friday on most of these NBC stations. This is Bob Murphy speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.